And a lot of that extremity comes from Islamism. If it is a purposeful political project designed, I hope I don't scare anybody when I say normative hegemony. Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. Qatar is a country we've been talking a lot about in recent days because, of course, that's where the World Cup is being hosted. But most of the politics people are talking about is to do with their human rights record, it's to do with gay rights, treatment of migrant workers in the construction of the stadium, the lives of women in that country. Almost nobody seems to be talking about another quite important issue, which is how much is Qatar involved in promoting Islamist ideas here in Western countries. A new report by the think tank Policy Exchange by Sir John Jenkins, who is a fellow there, investigates exactly this and has come to some quite stunning conclusions. He joins me in the studio. Hi, Sir John. Nice to be here. First of all, you really know what you're talking about in this area. Just to kind of establish your bona fides, you've been ambassador to Syria, Libya, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iraq, uh, Consul General in Jerusalem, uh, <laughs> where else? So you've uh, been a diplomat for 35 years. I was, I was years. a diplomat for 35 years, yeah, so mostly you, in the Middle East. It's fair to say that you, you understand that complicated region better than most. As much as you can, yes. And it's amazing how mysterious and hard to understand that region still is. We did an interview with the ambassador from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to the UK, last year and it's a, it's a I mean gulf is the word because there is a gulf of understanding between them give us a kind of overall introduction to the sometimes contradictory politics in those kind of places it's a, it's a very odd thing because the gulf in particular we used to know so much about i mean we were there as the uh, protecting uh, power from uh, from the late 18th century through to 1971 um and uh, virtually everybody in the foreign office when I joined who had been, who was an Arabist who dealt with the Middle East, had served in the Gulf. We knew huge amounts about it, and now we know very little. But, but at, it, at its heart, the, the thing that most of us sort of civilians don't really understand is what seems to be a central contradiction, which is, on the one hand, those countries are enormously conservative, is, to, is one way of putting it yes. mildly, and it and seem to turn away from Western ideas of a secular life, freedom, and human rights, and all of that. But on the other hand, they also seem to crave sort of endorsement by Western regimes, such as Qatar putting on the World Cup. Tell us about that contradiction. There's been some suggestion that Qatar is actually regretting <laughs> having, having, uh, how does one put it, bid uh, at one um, uh, the bid to, to, to stage the World Cup. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But it, but it's if you. If you think about the demographics of the region, so when I went to the Middle East in 1980, there were maybe uh, 250 million people living between Mauritania and, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the Gulf, which includes Iraq and Iran. There's now 400 million plus, of, uh, and about 70% of that 400 million are under 30. Um, Saudi Arabia has a, has a very young population. I think the median age in Saudi Arabia is about 21, 22. Some places is lower. Iraq, it's, I think it's 19. Some places is a little higher, and Lebanon is 31. But this, these are very, very young populations. And actually, if you look at, at polling that's done, and, the, and, the, and there was a surprising amount of polling that's, that's done of, of, of social attitudes uh, in the Gulf, and indeed the wider Middle East, you will find that people want um, uh, a variety of things that other people want. They want jobs, they want a decent life, they want marriage, they want, they want a lot of secular things. How far that will lead to social tensions, I think, is an interesting question that, that still has to be answered. I think one of, the, one of the interesting things about what's happened in Saudi Arabia since 2015 when, when, when King Salman when Prince Salman became king, Mohammed bin Salman became crown prince, is how much of the religious scholars have stayed silent on these reforms. Now, some of them have been imprisoned, some others have been intimidated, but there's been, but they said nothing. And it's, that surprised me. That still surprises me. Because that's really what this yes. report is about, yes. which is this thing we don't talk that much about right now. You know, when there's an atrocity, when there's a terrorist act, yeah. suddenly it comes back and yeah. everybody's talking about it, but Luckily, touch wood, for now that we've had a relatively quiet period, I mean, it sort of recedes into the background. Mm. But the fact is that in all of those states, there are these big underground forces which are religious fundamentalists of some kind, whether they're Wahhabists or Salafists, and, and trying to understand how much influence they exert over the government is a, is a difficult task. 
historically, the Saudi, and this is probably the fourth Saudi state since the mid-18th century. Historically, the Saudi state was based on an alliance between um, a political power center, which was the family, the El Saud, and the religious scholars. And they came together in the mid-18th century, very, very powerful. The one legitimated the other, and the other, and, 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 and the, the, the political power, the political center gave, gave, gave power and status to the religious scholars. It, it, was, a, it was a bargain. Um, that bargain has been renegotiated several times. And I think what we're seeing at the moment in Saudi Arabia is, a, is, 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 is another renegotiation of that contract. I think the religious scholars will accept reforms as they have before, as long as they are allowed to exercise uh, authority within a certain, a certain area. And that area is essentially about public piety. What are they the, being bribed? Is that what's happening, do you think? I mean, are these, are they, these re religious scholars or the, the family in Saudi that is responsible for that, they're becoming very rich, presumably, so they, they don't want to... There are mutual benefits, and I, you know, I, I think the religious scholars know that, that, that their own future depends upon the family, upon the El Saud, the continuation of Saud rule. I mean, what we saw in the early 2000s when there was, there was an attempted insurrection in the kingdom by uh, elements associated with Al-Qaeda is that it had failed. I mean, Saudi Arabia was not in a pre-revolutionary situation. It never has been, and it, and it isn't now. So there isn't a constituency for revolution. And if you had revolution, if they look around the region, they see disaster because revolutions lead to disaster. And it will lead to particular disaster in Saudi Arabia, given the particular nature of the, uh, of the, of the, of the state, its reliance upon religious legitimation, its possession, and custodianship of the, of the two holy sites uh, and so forth. And I think it, it, that would be an absolute disaster, which I think a lot of Saudi Arabia's own neighbors, particularly in the Gulf, understand very well. So whatever reservations they may have about certain things that happened in Saudi Arabia, certain things that Mohammed bin Salman may or may not have done, they think it is far- Such as the killing of journalist James Khashoggi. The, the, the murder of uh, Khashoggi was, 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 uh, was, a, was a horrible and brutal act. And the, um, the judicial process in Riyadh was entirely inadequate. Uh, there were details about how, who ordered and so forth, which you know I, nobody's really privy to. But but it it was it was horrible criminal. I knew Jamal. I mean Jamal, you know, it, was, it was it was awful. Um, as a lot of my Saudi friends will would say the same thing. But Saudi Arabia is not one guy. I mean, Saudi Arabia is a whole multitude of of, uh, of, of, of things. It was thirty million. It was, it was 20, 20, 22, 23 million Saudis. My my one question I have is. It's too important. I mean, that's my that's my issue. The Saudi Arabia is too important to allow to to to, 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 to co even to contemplate failure. Is it the same human beings, the same individuals, who at once tolerate or wave through or even encourage some of this really quite extreme to us behaviour, and then turn up at Western summits in a suit and a tie and are kind of encouraging Western influence. Are they the same people just leading kind of double lives or are they separate power centers within these guys? I think states? the Saudis, you know, one, 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 of the, one of the major, perhaps the most important uh, development within Islam over the last, what, 60, 70 years was the rise of what we call Salafism. You mentioned it earlier. Salafism um, has, has come to be understood as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a particular version of one of the four chief legal schools of Sunni Islam, there were four basic classical schools, and this is called Hanbalism. Hanbalism was always always had uh, the smallest number of adherents uh, in the in the uh, in the Arab world. It has become the biggest single current uh, in Islamic jurisprudence, largely because of Saudi funding, massive Saudi funding since the 1960s, through a variety of, of, of bodies, organisations, uh, 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 official and private funding. Um, and that was done for various reasons. A lot of it was to do with the threat that, that Saudi faced from Nasser in the 1960s uh, and from Nasserism and its continuation of leftists uh, and Ba'athists in the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s. I think the Saudis came to understand that this had been a mistake and this had come back to haunt them. And it came back to haunt them, of course, in the form of Osama bin Laden, who came out of this tradition, um, uh, along with the Muslim Brotherhood, and the two things combined. Uh, and it came back to haunt them in the form of, 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 this, of this attempted internal insurrection in the early 2000s. And they, they concluded very quickly that this was, uh, that what had happened is that they had created a domestic threat for themselves. They do not now officially sponsor much of this. And they've got a, a new um, a, a minister of, uh, of religious uh, endowments and so forth, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Ali. So you think Saudi, unlike Qatar, which we're about I to think talk Saudi about, stopped. has sort of reformed or... Yes, I do. 
Okay. And you're not Reform- saying that because you're ambassador there no. and you've gone loco. No, I know that. I know. I know they did. I mean, they reformed funding. This is not to say that funding doesn't find its way to these extremist groups in Saudi Arabia. There are all sorts of ways of getting private funding out. A lot of Saudis are extremely rich and will still will still provide funding to causes they think are, are, are admirable, whatever we think of them. Um, but the, the 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 government itself, through the Ministry of the Interior, cracked down very hard. Um, starting about 15, 16 years ago, under the late Mah- under Mah- Mohammed bin Naif, who was a former uh, prince. What's interesting hearing you talk is that it's not actually ideological. It's kind of realpolitik, isn't it, this? So you're, what, the way you describe it, a country like Saudi has been sponsoring these religious extremists, not because they believe that it, that's the pathway to heaven and that's the way to rescue the world, but because it gives them a regional advantage, it pushes out another political threat. There's a kind of tactical sponsorship yeah. of these things, and then it kind of has come back to haunt them. I mean, it became... What the Saudis wanted uh, was a form of Salafism that said you should obey the ruler, whatever the ruler's faults, as long as the ruler is within a fairly uh, tightly defined boundaries. That sounds convenient. And authentic, very convenient, an authentic Muslim ruler. Uh, th- th- there, is, there is a precedence in, in, in classical jurisprudence of this. Uh, it's called loyalist Salafism. So this is, a Salaf- this is a Salafism that says revolution is bad. Under virtually every circumstance, you should not challenge the ruler. The ruler, you know, unless the ruler is 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 uh, mentally incapable or physically incapable, and so forth. That sounds extremely handy if you're an autocratic king. It's extremely That's handy. The dream. Religion. But what it, what, it, what it also means is that these people do not then go about largely, although it has happened in certain circumstances, um, exporting, trying to export revolution or to export what you call in the Islamic tradition sedition, which is which is uh, a, a fitna. Um, uh, fitna. Uh, fitna, which means sedition. Um, uh, uh, we, we have, I think, there's still a sedition law on the on the on the, on the books in this country, but I don't think we've used it since about 1902. Um, and you know that that's an important concept in Islamic law. Um, so, but what they did was was at the same time, uh, perhaps by neglect, um, and there were certainly some people within the religious uh, establishment who wanted this to happen. They also sponsored a far more activist form of Salafism. Um, which said that you have to set very strict rules for what is Islamic or what is not Islamic, and what, it, what and what you define as not Islamic, even if the people who are doing it claim to be Muslims, you can call them kuffar. This was takfir, the, 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 the proclamation of other Muslims as infidels. This is one of the hinges of, of, of Al Qaeda, of, of the Islamic State, of the Jabhat al Nusra, all these organisations that sprang out of the ideological ferment originally in the 1970s in Saudi Arabia. A lot of this did come out of Saudi Arabia. Right, so that's the key change, is it? That if, if you can identify other Muslims as kafirs, yeah. that's sort of the beginning of a road towards a much more revolutionary or it is. And unstable it, it, and form and it's of... It's absolutely ruinous, because it gives you licence to kill um, uh, others. Uh, and that, that was not what the Saudis wanted, I think, at any point. Um, but you know, okay. once you've let these things out of the cage, they have a tendency to go and do what they like. So let's come on to Qatar then, yeah. which is our, our main topic. First of all, just establish for our audience what this country is. It's a tiny little peninsula in the Gulf, which has, what, 350,000 uh, resident inhabitants? Yes, about that. And just happened by pure chance to be situated on top of the largest natural yes. gas reserves in the yes. world. Yes, yes, which is shared with, which is shared with Iran. Um, uh, Bandar bin Sultan, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, who was the former uh, 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 head of the General Intelligence Presidency, which is internal security and indeed, National Security Advisor in Saudi Arabia, and Ambassador Washington, famously said of... Uh, it was his uh, son we interviewed last uh, year. Prince Khalid, who was the ambassador here, famously said of, uh, of, um, of Qatar, after they had established Al Jazeera, um, that it was basically three men and a, and, a, and a satellite TV station. So Qatar owns Al Jazeera. Yeah. So this, what, let's start with that. Why does a tiny country that's just making absolutely millions by doing no work at all, by just letting this stuff come out of the ground... Why do they want to have a big Western-facing media empire? I mean, interestingly, Al Jazeera came out of the failure of BBC Arabic uh, in the mid-90s. There was a project to have um, a BBC Arabic a satellite uh, station, which I, I, I failed, I think, for lack of money. Um, and a lot of the journalists they recruited then were, 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 were recruited by Qatar. And they were recruited by Qatar uh, under the new emir at the time, uh, Sheikh Hamad, who had uh, taken over from his father in the coup in '95, um, who had decided, I think, that they wanted to promote um, uh, uh, Qatar as, uh, uh, as, as in, in, in Arab terms, a progressive state, a progressive externally facing state. 
Um, so you have Al Jazeera. What's progressive in Arab terms? Uh, uh, well, Al Jazeera w- replaced before Al Jazeera, Arabic TV was uh, was essentially uh, state controlled TV. Mm-hmm. So it was endless um, shots of, of of leaders receiving other leaders with martial music playing. So it was dull as ditchwater, and there was very little news on it. So Al Jazeera becomes a genuine news station. So it looks as if you're joining the modern world, and suddenly you got this thing which is beamed across the Arab world, which everybody wanted to tune into. You need a satellite dish, and some places satellite dishes were banned in Iraq and so forth. But people found ways to get the satellite dishes because it was so popular. And you have this thing, and it's based in, in, in Qatar. So Qatar, at a stroke, looks like a modern, zappy, zeitgeisty sort of place because it's got this thing that nobody else has got. So they basically did it to be cool, like, yeah. or to gain influence. To over gain influence. And, 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 and to, you know, exactly, to build influence. And I think one of the, you know, we've seen this, I think, with Qatar over the years. Um, because it's so small, I mean, all these states are very small, um, apart from Saudi Arabia, so, which means they're very, and they're very rich, which means they're very vulnerable. And they have different approaches to, 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 uh, to mitigating that, that, that vulnerability. And what Gatter decided, I think, was to make sure that if there was trouble um, somewhere, or if there were troublesome currents in, the, in, 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 in Arab or Islamic thought or in, in the region, they would, they would make sure they happened a long way away from Gatter's borders. So they're projecting outwards. And Al Jazeera was one of these sort of things that physically projected news outwards. But we've seen this in the way that they have deployed funding as well, um, which will... will but ultimately, will presumably about. controlled by the Qatari yes. regime. Yes. I mean, all the money, it's like in Saudi Arabia, and the money is, all the money in the circulation of the economy is essentially energy money. I mean, you, you, some of it goes into construction, there's other bits of the economy. But the money ultimately is, is, is energy money. And in, 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 in Qatar, it's gas, mm. basically. They've got a small amount of oil, but it's gas. But that kind of history then makes quite a lot of sense of why they would want to bid for this World Cup, why the, in a sense it's, a, it's an extension of the same impulse, which is they want, whilst be, remaining extremely conservative, allowing religious fundamentalism yeah. to be, have, a, have a stronghold there, they also want Western-facing influence and they want in some way to get the approval of the Western world. And the, West, and, and the, and the wider world as well, to cultivate a constituency. I mean, if you look at where, the, where, where Gulf energy goes these days, I mean, 40 years ago, most of it went went west. Now, now 60-70% of it goes east. It goes to, it goes to you know, India, Japan, China, China in particular, Korea. Um, and so, football is the perfect language for that because all countries in the world are interested. Absolutely. So, so they have an interest. They have an economic interest now in, 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 in the east. And one, there was an interesting uh, issue about, about the development of, of Gulf relations with China in particular. Uh, and when I say the Gulf, I mean Iran as well. Um, but this, um, uh, this projection... It's projection of a sort of modernity of the chimes with, with younger people in particular. Um, there was another, there was another aspect to this, which is that Qatar is the only other so-called Wahhabi state in the world. So, so other the, than Saudi. Other than Saudi. I mean, they, the, the, the Qataris are from Nej, they're from the, the peninsula, they're from the, um, the, the central plateau in the peninsula, just like Saudi as well. Um, and they are Wahhabis. So, so they are, just they for are our viewers, then, Wahhabi means. Wahhabi is, is a term which comes from the, 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 the original religious scholar who joined up with the first Saudi, Saudi uh, emir. Uh, uh, his name was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, which is why they're called Wahhabis, because he's the guy. He said that he was a renewer of Islam, that he was going back to the fundamentals, uh, that everything was going to be very basic. He wasn't going to talk about theology or any of this stuff. It was about, it was about behavior, and it was about, uh, it was about a certain uh, very rigid doctrines. This then becomes Salafism. It, 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 it emerges... So he's the sort of Martin Luther of he is, the Islamic he is. world. He said, well, let's, the, let's, the, the, let's go strict, back to source, ultra. It was, it was back to basics in a very big way um, in, the late, in the mid to late 18th century. So they're called Wahhabis. The, the, the Saudis object to the term, and it was banned actually in 1929 by Abdulaziz, the first, uh, uh, the first king. But what does it mean in terms of rules of life, society? What, it, means, what is... you, it, means you don't, it means you reject, by and large... Um, you reject theology. I mean, there was a very sp- a, a strong current in, in, in Islam, the theology of speculation about God. They, was, re- they reject all of this. It's, it's, it's a sort of Calvinism. Mm. I mean, I don't want to make pushing comparison too far because it, it, the comparisons can be misleading. And, but, but, the, but there are sort of similarities with, with, with certain forms of extreme Protestantism. There's a form of Calvinism which privileges the text. So, you know, so in, in, uh, with the Reformation, you've got the, infamish, the, the, the emphasis on, 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 on the text itself, sola scriptura, um, and you get that, the same emphasis in, in Salafism. And it's the literal meaning 
of the words in the text. So when it says, you know, God has an, so they will say God has one eye, because all we can say about God is the Quran talks about one eye. It talks about one hand. I mean, it's it, 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 it's all a bit and in it, terms of interpretation of the so, rules of so, how to live so your rejects, life. So it rejects it rejects a lot of the accretions which they say um, uh, uh, adhered to Islam um, uh, over the centuries. Um, things like um, the cultivation of of, uh, of graves, so their graves are unmarked, famously unmarked, even for the kings. Um, uh, the cult of saints, um, all the things that sort of reflected folk beliefs. Uh, popular beliefs or Sufi beliefs. How about things like women? Um, they also reject any concept of development of doctrine, which is an important aspect of, of, of modern Christianity, of course, but, 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 and, but has also been something that we've seen in Islam, but they reject all of this. It is basically what it says in the Quran and certain hadith. The hadith are the sayings, the reported sayings or, or actions of the Prophet, which have been certified by religious scholars and so forth. And the aim is to imitate um, the actions, uh, beliefs and practices of the very first generation of Muslims, the Prophet and his companions, which is why they're called Salafis, because the Salaf means the predecessors, the pious predecessors. So th what strikes me is that although they might claim to believe these ultra-conservative things, at least among the leadership, they don't seem to live by them. And you get these princes and wealthy Qataris, Saudis, coming over to London, um, buying you know, unbelievably flash cars. They go to nightclubs and spend hundreds of thousands of pounds, certainly are not behaving by their own rules. And so there's the reputation of hypocrisy there. Is it fair? Is it, is it fair? You know, there are an awful lot of Saudis who are genuinely conservative and behave in a genuinely conservative way. Um, there were uh, there were significant numbers of Saudis who were very rich uh, and not very conservative and don't. Um, in Qataris, way, uh, Qataris, uh, Qataris as well. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so and you see them on the streets of London. The whole supercar thing, you know, coming and you know, the rest of what happens in, in London. Not all of them go to the nightclubs, not all of them booze, but some of them do. They would say, I guess, in their defence, that that they that they're not hypocrites because they don't believe this stuff anyway. But but they have to be, they have to conform to social um, uh, practices and social customs in Saudi Arabia or Qatar because that's the way the state is set up. Um, and this is this is the tribute that that that, that, that vice, as it were, pays to virtue. Um, is there hypocrisy? Sure, there's hypocrisy. There's hypocrisy in every society. Um, well, one hypocrisy that would be very present and dangerous to us is if you're right in the report that you've written, suggesting that the Qatari government, while with one hand and one face welcoming the world yep. to the World Cup, and yes. trying to sort of gloss over things like human rights and yep. gay rights, which is what everyone's obsessed with, with the other hand, is actually directly paying for and funding yep. Islamist organisations yes. on our own shores yep. that are providing yes. da dangers to our own people. Tell us what you've found out. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting with the World Cup because I think this 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 this, this obsessive discourse about about uh, about LGBTQ plus plus rights and the rest of it, in a way, obscures the central issue, which is this: the export. It's a distraction. That it it's it's for me, it's a distraction. I understand why people go on about it, but it, for me, it's a distraction. Um, uh, because a lot of these things are actually common across the Middle East and, and, and North Africa, and indeed in many Islamic countries. So, so there's an issue about the, diff the distinction between Islam and Islamism. Islam is a civilizational system. It's 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 a, it's a set of of of, of um, a practices and beliefs which have been evolved over one and a half uh, millennia. Um, it's a jurisprudential system which which has a, a 1400 year old uh, uh, history of, 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 of often highly sophisticated textual analysis and so forth. Islamism is different. Islamism is a um, is, a, is a modernist political mobilization of Islam in the interests of state control, of, 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 of political control in a state. Um, and uh, which is why it's important to understand the distinction. They are, they, are, they are two different things. So building a mosque is fine. Building a mosque that supports the Muslim Brotherhood, which advocates um, uh, the, uh, an Islamic state under Sharia law, a lot of the details of which are vague, is an entirely different matter. One is, is, is a faith system uh, reflecting a civilizational project. The other is a political, 
a political a, a project, and it's Islamism that they promote. You know, I talk in the paper, the, 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 the original, the foundational movement of, of, of Islamism is the Muslim Brotherhood, which was set up in the 19, established in the 1920s. What is the Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah, yeah, the Muslim so Brotherhood it's a, it's a Muslim political Muslim. movement. It's a political movement set up by a man called Hassan al-Banna in Egypt in 1928, uh, partly as a result. I mean, it was a response to, to colonialism. It was a response, a response to an emerging middle class in Egypt, which felt uh, humiliated uh, and um, uh, and uh, economically um, uh, disadvantaged. Well, it, recently they actually took power in Egypt. They did, and, and with, with the Freedom and Justice Party in, in 2000 and 2012. Is it, it a terrorist organisation designated by the Foreign Office? Uh, it's not designated by the Foreign Office, and, and you know, it's it's it, it, for me, it's a fool's errand designated by Muslim Brother, Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is lots of different things. Have the Muslim Brotherhood. Over the years, been involved in terrorist actions. Yes, they have. I mean, Hamas is a Muslim Brotherhood organisation, and that is they, a terrorist they say so on the job. That, that is designated as a terrorist organisation by the British government, by the United States. So the Qatari government is paying for mosques and schools, mm. organisations within France, within the UK, and within Germany, in Germany, and within Germany that are supporting and teaching. What yes. exactly? What are they teaching? There is something called the Muslim Brotherhood um, program. And this has changed over the years because the Muslim Brotherhood itself has, has become more Salafi uh, uh, over the years, largely as a result of, their, of the influence of, of, of Saudi. Which means more extreme. Funding, become more rigorous, 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 become more fundamental. I mean, fundamental, fundamentalism is, 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 a, is a weasel word, but they've become, they've become much stricter in the way that they interpret um, Islamic rules and more dangerous to the West because of it. Because essentially, if you because the Muslim Brotherhood um, is like all Islamist movements, a supremacist, because it believes in the supremacy of Islam not just as a religious order but as a political order as well. So that's crucial because that suddenly you were talking earlier how the Saudis had made a mistake in sponsoring types of movements that actually didn't yeah. believe in the, their own. Yes. Right to rule, and then you have a revolution. It's like so. A, Muslim Brotherhood also. What does it want? A single united uh, Ummah? Yeah, what they, is they, it they, they, want? They, they say they want a caliphate. Yes. Now, in practice, do they work towards a caliphate? Um, if they do, it, it's pretty crab wise. But that's that's their ambition, and they talk about the Ummah. They can often be confused about this, or, 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 or um, uh, they're not always consistent about this. So, if you're an Egyptian Muslim brother, you will talk about Egypt, but you'll also talk about the Ummah, which is which is this transnational community of believers. So that when you say caliphate, the the dream then is to have all Muslims worldwide yeah. united into a single political entity, yes. headed by a caliph, yes, who would presumably be a religious teacher of some kind. Or well, there were various rules for being a caliph. One of which is you have to come from the prophet's general lineage, the prophet's lineage, the caliph, um, and you have to be a qualified. And this is what ISIS was also trying to make happen. So, so ISIS come out of uh, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi was in his youth a Muslim brother. Um, there were various testimonies to this. So this um, is as was, as was Osama bin Laden. Uh, so the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood, there were different strands in the Muslim Brotherhood itself. A lot of this comes out of a man called Sayyid Qutb, who writes in the 1950s, 19, uh, uh, 19, uh, late, most of the 1950s, the early 1960s. Um, and he writes a, a famous book called Milestones and one called In the Shadows of the Quran, which reinterprets the Quran in the light of modern Egyptian politics, and he advocates essentially a Leninist, vanguardist approach to taking over state. Uh, and in the end, he was executed by Nasser in '66 for an attempted uh, insurrection, a revolutionary insurrection, which he he says himself he was involved in. I mean, it was it was it was stupid and it was, it was pointless and it was incompetent. But that's beside the point. But so the the organization as it is today in 2022 of the Muslim Brotherhood has now. Tentacles into countries such yes, as the UK, France, and Germany, oh, and yeah. they are the heirs of the people you're describing. There are different uh, levels of discourse within the Muslim Brotherhood, within the Muslim Brotherhood milieu, and, and they will, a lot of them will say. And when I wrote the Muslim Brotherhood Review in 2014 for David Cameron, um, uh, I, when I, which I did with the late Charles Farr, um, I, I, I travelled. I was still ambassador in Saudi Arabia, and I travelled to. Um, I think twelve or thirteen different countries in the Middle East to to, to, to interview uh, uh, military uh, uh, politicians, officials, uh, security people, and a lot of Muslim brothers as well. And the question I put to all the Muslim brothers was, "What do you mean?" Because this is this is, this is this is they will say they will say two things. One is our policy is peaceful, 
So they'll say Silmia, which is which is we are this is the path of peace. And they will say well, our aim is for a civil state within the framework of Sharia, which is Islamic law. So the question I'd ask them, what do you mean by a civil state within the the, 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 the framework of Sharia? Because Sharia is predicated on a political religious community, not on a secular community. It's predicated on revelation as a basis for law rather than independent reason as a basis for law. And they were uniformly unable to explain to me clearly what they meant. Because it's actually a contradiction. Because they are trying to yoke two things together. I think that reflects a genuine quandary that they have inside the organisation. But essentially, you know, this if you, if you take the word of God as the basis for uh, for the political community and indeed for for law, the law which 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 governs that community, that is a revolutionary project. Uh, it certainly can be very hard to exist peacefully in a democracy where I, the legitimacy I, comes from from beneath, from the voters. They will say that this is a gradual process. There are some who say, well, you know, the, 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 the voters are the equivalent of the Islamic concept of shura, which is consultation. So there's all sorts of ways in which they can try to. They think. try and square the. <clears throat> I, th- I think I think they are they are I think they are genuinely some of them are genuinely trying to find a way to square these circles. I just think they're they're not squareable myself. Let's talk about a specific example. So one of the examples you talk about in this report is what's going on in Sheffield. Mm. Um, most people. If they're from the UK, will know Sheffield as a, a you know, formerly industrial yes. centre in the uh, northern Midlands, and basically not much more than that. Why on earth are they choosing Sheffield to be a sort of centre of Islamist thought? South Yorkshire, I think you'll find. I mean, I, I have sisters who live in Sheffield. I think they, they'd object to being described as North Midlands. South Yorkshire, um, sorry. South Yorkshire. Um, why they chose Sheffield, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, there, there are significant. But there's Muslim, a big Muslim There are community. significant Muslim communities up in up in South Yorkshire. So Rotherham, ha- Rother, Rotherham has them. Sheffield uh, has them. Uh, uh, Leeds, Bradford, and so forth. I mean, and it, and is, what have the Qataris supported? So they're fund, they funding the, the, the construction of a giant mosque and, and, and community centre with, with all the associated facilities, such um, as such as uh, such as creches, such as educational facilities, um, uh, meeting halls, um, uh, and so forth. Um, and it's interesting how this came out. I mean, the Times, Andrew Norfolk in the Times, did, did, did a great job um, in, uh, in, in, in looking at all of this. Um, he was also drawing on, on work which had been done by two French journalists, uh, Christian Chenot and uh, Georges Marguerite, um, who had written three books about, about this culminating what was called the Gatta Papers. And, they, and they'd clearly got access to a whole trove of emails, uh, financial statements, uh, financial reports, um, uh, uh, audits and other documents, which were supposed to be confidential, about the way in which the Gatos were funding. So it looks like from from the report here, which you're drawing on their work, but there's a kind of nested series of charities yes, and organisations that are kind of distantly yes. but ultimately connected. So to this Qatari. came out. This came out of, the, of this work, and, and, it, it, and you could find it also in, in, in Andrew's Andrew Norfolk's report of the Times. It is quite hard to get a grip on the fine on, on, on the on the financials of all of this because so much of it. Is 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 so much of the of the of the of the, of the, of the financing system is complicated and is is nested in other entities. So a lot of this seems to have come out of of, uh, of the uh, of Gatta Charity, Gatta Charity UK. Then renames itself the Nectar Trust, and then the na- and then the thing in Sheffield is called the Amman Trust. So if we if we take that as as red, then rather than having to establish it again, first of all, why are they doing it? Yeah. And second of all, what's the danger to us? Well, I mean, and, and this actually, what's happening in Sheffield, you see repeated. There are interesting heat maps of all of this in, in the in the, in the Gatta papers um, uh, by Shannon and Malbrunet. Uh, and it's, it's all over France. And it's, it's not just Sheffield. There's a lot of other activities you see of Gatta in this country. They're doing a big project in London called the Ramadan Tent Project, which has been going, I think, for the last 10 years. And the people they're partnering with, a lot of the people they're partnering with in the Ramadan Tent Project are people from Mend and Cage, which are deeply suspect organisations. Um, uh, and is deeply Islamist organisations. So why are the Qataris doing this? Why are they doing it? That's, that is an interesting question to which I still don't entirely know the answer. And I've asked a lot of people, including a lot of Qataris, why, uh, why they do In fact, why they're doing what they do in general. I think part of it is because they are um, a Wahhabi state and the legitimacy of rule. And, and one of the other interesting things about Qatar is they don't have a, a, a cadre of religious scholars. Saudi does and has done since, since, since the 18th century. Qatar doesn't, because it was a much later foundation. Um, so the rulers are not particularly constrained by, um, uh, by, uh, by the opinions of religious scholars. 
the one religious scholar they so there's did no have, sort of moderation there's no there's infrastructure no, there's, there's, there's no sort of dialectic between the two the one religious scholar they did have who was who was globally influential was Yusuf al Qardawi who was the uh, generally regarded as a senior uh, uh, jurisprudent of the Muslim Brotherhood internationally who was Egyptian by origin uh, he had Qatari nationality, but because he was he wasn't he wasn't tribal or anything like that, so he had no personal constituency. So he was someone that they could instrumentalize um, uh, to 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 legitimate what they were, what they were doing. But by legitimating what they were doing in terms of spreading Islam, and and you see this in in in, in some of the in some of the foundational statements of the Qatar charity, for example, when they say part of part of our, our, our role is to spread is to spread Islam essentially, uh, and 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 spreading Islam is historically one of the key elements of legitimacy for an Islamic ruler. Mm. It used to be spread by jihad, you know, annual jihad used to be uh, incumbent upon all legitimate uh, uh, armed jihad, uh, uh, Islamic rulers. Now, so the, in Islam, a way, the answer to the question why they're doing it is because it's literally in their constitution almost. It, what you're saying is that by being a Wahhabi state, it means you view one of your fundamental duties as spreading Islam, and this is yes. a natural process of doing and so. It's, it's, it's almost a non question Which was why the Saudis did it, to, in, in, as well as seeking to combat um, uh, secularism, leftism, Nazism in the rest of the 1960s, 1970s. So, so let me ask the follow-up question then, which is, what is the danger to us? The danger of social cohesion. I think one of the things, uh, that, that one of the fundamental principles of, uh, of Saudi Salafism, which arises in the 19th century, is something called al wala wal bara al wala wal bara literally al wala wal bara wal bara literally means allegiance and separation and it means you pay you, 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 your allegiance is to the islamic community and you should separate yourself from everybody who is non-islamic this is this, this it becomes in some ways a sort of precursor to takfirism to this, you know, declaring everybody of whom you, of whose practices you disapprove as non-muslim this remains a central tenet of uh, of, of Salafism, it is it is a central tenet of certain forms of brotherhood, of Salafized brotherhood activity. And, and is that and, being and, taught and, and, in places like Sheffield, as far uh, as you know? I think one of the reasons that they construct and and the if you in the report um, there is an explicit statement by this um, uh, on I think the website of the Gata Charity, but it's in the report that the aim is to enable Muslims to exist within a Muslim environment, an entirely Muslim environment, and not have to engage with a non-Muslim environment. This seems to me um, uh, uh, absolutely um, damaging for any form of, of social cohesion. If we think the future, we, you know, we've talked about multiculturalism in this country and, 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 and tolerance and the rest of it. But if you're having communities living entirely separate lives, I don't see where social cohesion, I mean, you can argue about whether multiculturalism has produced social cohesion or not, but I don't see the prospect of, of, of social cohesion any time in the near future for those who, 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 who espouse this sort of, this sort of doctrine or, or who, are, who, who are brought in to these sort of these environments. What I think people listening might think is, why are we letting them do this? Good because question. It's it's every government seems to discover this anew. Yeah. I remember it was a it was yeah. a scandal during the Blair yes. era that there was sure. Saudi money coming in funding some of his new types of schools and there was gender segregation and yes. all sorts of things happening. And yet time and time again nothing seems to be done about it. So here we are sending our team to the World yeah. Cup, being best friends with the Qataris. Uh, meanwhile they are funding schools that by your account actually threaten the cohesion of our society. Yeah, I think, you know, people, uh, I mean, there's a broad question about, the, about how politics function in this country uh, these days and, and whether, whether politicians actually know how to exercise power anymore. Um, but story think, for another day, perhaps. But that's it for another day. Um, um, clearly wanting to be best buddies with Gato in, in, in an era uh, of, uh, of energy scarcity um, makes economic sense. Um, I actually think, you know, or, or, Gas isn't fungible in the way that oil is, but you'd still be able to do the contracts, whether you whether you whether you approved or disapproved of what the Gatwis do in terms of Islamism and the export or promotion of Islam, uh, Islamism uh, elsewhere. But I think politicians tend to confuse the two, that we need to be friends. And I think you know there is there is, uh, and I saw this. If I can sort of have a sort of have a have a have a when I was moment in Libya in 2011, when it was clear to me that the Gatwis were subverting. Um, any hope uh, of a proper political process after the fall of Gaddafi 
by funding exclusively Islamist militias. And I kept saying to London, you know, you need to do something about this. We need to talk to the Emir, we need to talk to Sheikh Tamim, uh, who was the crown prince at that point. And or everything I got back from London, and it is from Doha, was you're worrying too much. You're overcomplicating it. Um, the Gatterers just want to do the right thing and support democracy and the rest of it. It's absolute nonsense. So you felt they were actively not listening to you because it was inconvenient? I think people, are, I think ministers, a lot of ministers, senior ministers in particular, had been turned off the Middle East because of Iraq. I think you know, what, the, the, the impact of Iraq was long-standing in terms of not wanting to get your hand in any sort of Middle Eastern mangle. Um, but also, I think people, ministers just didn't understand. You know, I think there was, there, was, there was a failure of understanding uh, at, at, very, at very senior levels in the British government. And, you know, it was a failure, of my, uh, on, it was part of my failure that I failed to, to, to persuade enough people to take this seriously. You know, if you talk to, if you talk to people uh, who, who are in senior positions then, now, a lot of them will say, yes, we understand and, and, and we got it wrong. I mean, the examples are beyond just the one you've mentioned in Sheffield. Even Batley Grammar, last year, there was this big controversy because Batley, uh, which is a, a local school, yeah. had this protest going yes. on with one of the teachers had been banned because yeah. he had shown a picture of the prophet yes. to people in class and the parents were protesting. He was sent home on sort of temporary suspension. The whole thing was very strange. And it turns out that Batley Grammar is listed on the Qatar yes. Foundation International website and therefore is basically... It's bizarre. I mean, I mean, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you look at the list of schools, I mean, they, they, there's, a, there's a very long list of schools that they, they claim to be supporting. And my guess is that a lot of those schools are actually Islamic schools. Um, the Batley Grammar School thing is, is, just, is, just, is just, just very, very odd. Um, and I think... I mean, in a way, it's also an example of the inability of, of politicians to work out what to do when you when you encounter uh, a, a milieu which which has been formed by um, by extreme um, uh, an extreme interpretation of, of, of Islamic uh, jurisprudence and other doctrines, and a lot of that extremity comes from Islamism. It, it is it is a purposeful political project designed, um, I, I hope I don't scare anybody, but when, when I say normative hegemony, normative hegemony uh, within, within, within the, the Islamic... the tr creating what is considered normal, i.e. Yeah, the kind of dominant yeah, narrative. Absolutely, the dominant, the dominant, uh, dominant practices, dominant, dominant thought, dominant discourse in a, in a given society. So they won't stop until they achieve that. No, and, and, this, was, and this was foundational for the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna said. We will reform society from, from, from within. It's when people change that we will have the change in, 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 in the political system. Let me just list out, you also, um, you also mention a number of other investments that the Qatari Investment Authority has made. Within the UK alone, Sainsbury's, Heathrow Airport, British Airways, Harrods, the Shard, the Savoy, Claridge's, Canary Wharf, the London Stock Exchange, the Ritz, Barclays, and the former United States Embassy building in Grosvenor Square are all part yes. or completely owned yeah. by the state of Qatar. Yeah. And you see the same in France, you see the same in Germany. It's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary. And it's we have no sort of check on that. There's no part of the government thinking, oh, I've never seen it. I mean, what I have seen is, is, is ministers from time to time bigging up the possibility of Gatwick investment in the, in the UK. The only productive investment, in the sense, investment that, that, that will that will lead that will produce procure uh, a, a genuine capacity growth uh, and probably employment, is um, is a proposed investment in, in, in a new LNG terminal at Milford Haven, which would be generally a good thing. This is so unusual for the Gatterers. I believe it when I see it, uh, and if I do see it, it'll be because this is in the interest of Gatter. It, it, it'll enable them to export more gas uh, at uh, on long-term contracts at favourable prices to the UK, which is fine. when I mean, we need the energy, but everything else they buy into exists. I mean, a lot of it's they're buying influence. Property. They're, they're buying, yeah, yeah, and they're buying returns. They're buying rates of return. Um, it's, it's a bit like the Glazers of Manchester United. You you you, you buy into something and, and you have a guaranteed rate of return. But it's it's but it's not investment in the sense. I mean, you know, you know, Blair and Cameron both said we want investment in infrastructure. None of this is investment in infrastructure. It's not productive. It's not productive. You've spent a lot of your career in the Middle East in these Gulf states. What surprises me listening to you is that you're not especially positive about them. Quite often, diplomats who've spent their whole lives somewhere come back as a kind of, you know convert in some way and telling everyone how wonderful they are. To put it frankly, you don't seem to like the Qataris very much. Is, is that fair? <laughs> the Gatteris are not the Middle East. The Gatteris are a very small state. Um, 
I was, I, I, my experience in Libya was formative for me. I, I, really, I really thought what they did was destructive. Um, and I, there, was no, there was no other single state um, in my uh, time in the, in, in, in the Middle East, which goes back to the, to the, to the early 1980s, uh, which, in my opinion, has been uh, as exercised as destructive an influence um, on, on, on the social and political fabric of other countries in the region, um, and to a certain extent, uh, perhaps in the future, even more um, in 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 uh, in Europe, uh, and to a certain extent in the United States than than than, uh, than than Qatar. The Saudis did do a lot of this in the 1960s, 1970s. Then they stopped doing it. Um, and you know, I think given you know, I love I love the Middle East and North Africa. It, it, it is it is the most extraordinary. Extraordinary region. It is attractive. The, the people are energetic, creative, and the rest of it. Um, but the abiding problem in the Middle East has been has been misgovernance, and this has been the case since the nineteen twenties. Um, doing something about that, doing something about corruption, and you know we talk about the corruption in, in, in the, in the, associated with the bid um, in two thousand and ten for the World Cup. Doing something about respecting the choices of ordinary people rather than trying to force. Um, choices on them or frame their choices in a certain way seems to be absolutely essential. And in the meantime, should we be putting barriers up to this kind of buying of influence? I think so. At the, at the very least, what we need to do is know what the scope of the issue is. You know, one of the problems with working out how much the Gatwaves are putting into, into various projects in this country, including this list project, is the opacity of the financial structures of the Gat, of, of the, of the, Gata, uh, the Gata Institute, the Gata, uh, 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 Charity, um, uh, and, the various, and the various other organisations and, and, and financing instruments at the disposal of the, of the Dewan uh, in, in, in Doha. So, and, th and this actually applies also on a sort of wider scale to the issue of, 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 of corrupt money coming through this country. I think actually doing something about financial reporting, the, making, making precise and accurate and fully transparent financial reporting, uh, essentially, across the board, uh, so you see who the ultimate beneficiary you, you is. Know the, it's you know who the ultimate beneficiary is, yes. So John Jenkins, thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. It was fun. That was Sir John Jenkins, the former British ambassador to Burma, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Jerusalem, someone who is familiar more than most with the Middle East and the internal politics of Gulf states. And frankly, what he was saying was very plain, which is that we should not be being as supportive as we are of the Qatari state, or in particular, we shouldn't be allowing their money to be coming over to places like the UK and France and Germany, buying influence, buying up chunks of important national companies, and setting up educational organisations which are teaching our children some form of extreme Islamist ideology. It's been talked about before in previous decades, for some reason, people seem to have got bored of it right now. But it seems like if we're going to talk about Qatar, and if we're going to focus on the politics of that country, given the, the World Cup, this is a rather more important issue to talk about. So thanks to him, and thanks to you for tuning in. This was Unheard.